It's the third chapter of Genesis. And we're going to start in the first verse. We're going to read the, uh, through the 13th verse, but uh, just bear with me. Got a little bit of reading to start. Uh, this week I was going to try to teach uh, and preach a sermon on, you know, uh, right and wrong, good and evil. And as I got to study, and that's just too big to try to preach, or I'd keep you here till 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon, and uh, I ain't built for that. Uh, <laughs> the Lord would have to be in it awfully strong for that. So uh, if the Lord will help us, let's, let's read these uh, verses. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, when your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord." Amongst the trees of the garden, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. (laughs) And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me or tricked me, and I did eat. We'll stop there. It's not my fault. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We thank you and we praise you once again for the privilege of being in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've given us to stand behind this desk, Lord, to read from your holy anointed word. And Lord, we ask that you anoint us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet, Lord, to speak the words that you would have us to speak. Anoint the ears of the people to hear the words. And Lord, we pray that your word goes out and that it doesn't go out void, Lord, that it touches heart, that it changes lives, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you send a revival into this land, Lord, that you reach out to your people, that you bring them back in the house of God, back under the covering of your precious blood. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ's precious holy name. Amen. Amen. So it's not my fault, Lord. It's not my fault. As we go through these things, as we look at the first couple verses in Genesis, as a matter of fact, if we look at the creation story, we see that God looked down and he created the earth. And it said in the beginning, it said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so what happened? He created, he created land. He created light and darkness. He created order out of chaos. See, in the beginning, there was just chaos. In the beginning, there was nothing about it. But when God finished creating life, when he finished creating light and darkness, when he finished creating the earth, when he finished hanging the moon and the sun and all that, he sat back and said, it is good. See, that's what is good. He sat back and looked at it all and he said it was good. But see, not everybody was happy with the way God was doing things. We know about Satan. The Bible tells us about Satan, an angel of God who rebelled against God. See, what had happened was God created this earth, and he gave mankind dominion over it. He gave mankind authority over all that. But when God kicked Satan out of heaven because he rebelled against God, when God kicked Satan and a third of the angels out, Satan says, I know what I'll do. I can't can't overthrow God. I can't take over God. But this earth that he gave mankind authority over, I'm going to start chaos down there. I'm going to take that over. I can't overthrow God, but I'm going to hurt his creation see he did those things because he looked around and he goes i want to create chaos 
as we look around in our life today, as we look around in our world today, what are we seeing? We're seeing chaos. We're seeing confusion. We're seeing all kinds of things. Why? Because there's confusion about the roles of men and women. There's confusion about the roles of husbands and wives. There's confusion about the roles of moms and dad. There's confusion about the roles of all kinds of things. We hear transgender and homosexuality. We hear this. We hear that. We hear all kinds of other stuff. There's confusion about the value of life. We hear them talking about abortion. The next thing we're going to hear them talking about, no doubt, is euthanasia. Why? Because there's confusion about the value of life because we no longer value the moral things that the Word of God has set forth for us. We're embracing the chaos and we're getting away from the order that God has created in His Word. See, think about what Satan got for just a few bites of an apple. Think about what Satan was able to trade for just a few bites of an apple. You'll realize that he got the best end of the deal. You'll realize all that. See, just for a few bites of that forbidden fruit, long after the sweetness of that fruit was gone, long after they could probably even remember what that fruit tasted like, Adam and Eve were paying the price for that few bites of pleasure, for that moment in the sun, for that little bit of thing. See, they made the dumbest decision of their life in an instant because it looked good. It said, oh, the tree looked pretty. Oh, the tree looked pretty. It was good to look upon. And it was, you know, it was going to make us as gods. So for a few moments of pleasure, for just a few bites, Satan got to drag chaos into this world that God had given us authority over. And see, how many times does that happen? See, Satan depends on us to make silly decisions. Satan depends on us to make unwise decisions. He depends on us to do the same thing. Look all throughout time. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, just for a temporary fix for hunger. We see Achan gave up his life for a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment. We see David sacrifice generations of hardship in his family just because he wanted to spend a few minutes with Bathsheba. See, just for a few minutes, for a few little bites of the apple, we trade all kinds of things. See, Satan's really not offering that much when we really come to think about it, but he wants everything. See, it seems like a good deal at the time. It seems like a good deal at the time. For a moment of pleasure, a little bit of financial gain, uh, somebody's applause. We look at all those things. We discover that we've given up everything, and Satan got it all just for a few moments of time. See, he's counting on that. But when that happens, we start looking for somebody to blame. When that happens, when things start going wrong, when we realize that we've messed up, when we realize that, you know, we've sinned, we want to blame somebody else. See, in the third chapter of Genesis, we see what happened right there. God was coming into the garden, walking in the cool of the day, and he started looking around for Adam and Eve like he, he used to. He'd walk through the garden. He'd like to spend the afternoon talking to Adam and Eve. Hey, Adam, where you at? Well, I'm over here behind the bushes, Lord. I heard you, I heard you coming. Uh, yeah. Why are you over behind the bushes? I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? Well, that woman you gave me. Wh Eve, what did you do? Well, the serpent tricked me, Lord. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't withstand it. See, they hid, they made, you know, aprons out of fig leaves. You know, they realized, hey, I can't do that. So Adam's saying, don't blame me, don't blame me. See, when our sins are found out, we go, don't blame me, it's not my fault. But it is. See, so let's look at the more today at some of the things that happen, because it's not our fault. See, the Bible clearly tells us that we're responsible for our own actions, but we want to say it's not our fault. Well, have you ever heard anybody say, well, that's just the way I am? That's just the way I am. See, you might have a temper. That's my favorite one. Everybody's like, I got a temper. Sometimes it's a violent temper. Sometimes, you know, their kids go run into the other rooms. Maybe there's even some bruises on mom. Maybe there's, you know, even some things. And their family's scared of them. Well, you know, yeah, I may get mad, but that's just the way I am. I've got a hot temper. I'm just mad. That's just, that, there's nothing I can do about it. Or, you know, God constantly reminds us in the Bible that we are responsible for our actions. You know, we have choices to make. Or maybe you go the other way. Maybe you don't have a temper. Maybe you just like to be quiet, don't like to say anything. You just saw up. Stick your lower lip out. Pow. I'm not going to talk to them for three weeks. 
And you're just hoping they ask you, what's wrong? Nothing. Are you sure nothing? Nothing. And just saw up and pout and carry on. It's, it's not my fault. God gave me this personality. That's just the way I am. You know, they just walk around, do that, hoping that somebody asks them, what's wrong? Well, don't blame me. Well, maybe you should go talk to somebody. I'm not talking to them. Maybe you go see what's wrong. I'm not talking to them. That's just the way I am. I don't like that. See, it's not my fault. That's just the way I am. Or it's somebody else's fault. I've got a temper because dad had a temper. I get sold up because mom used to get sold up. She used to do that to manipulate people. So that's the way I learned. You know, it's somebody else's fault. You know, that's the way I behave. See, a lot of people go into counseling. And don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against counseling other than this one simple fact. It's a good idea to know what drives you. It's a good idea to understand the relationship between your parents, between your brothers and sisters. But when they're looking for something that happened in your past to blame your actions on, that's when it gets wrong. Listen, you are responsible for your actions. You're responsible for the choices you make. You can't blame it on mom. You can't blame it on dad. You can't blame it on the people you run with. See, there's a lot of people that go, oh, I would quit smoking, but everybody around me smokes. Oh, if they would stop smoking, I would stop smoking. Oh, yeah, I know, it, I know it's wrong to drink too much, but everybody around me socializes that way, and if they would stop drinking, I would stop drinking. Oh, all my friends do drugs, and if I want to hang out with them, I've got to do drugs too. Listen, don't blame other people. It's the choices that you make. See, we want to go, oh, it's not my fault. That's just the way I'm made. Or it's somebody else's fault. You know, we try to find somebody to blame these things on. We can't blame things on anybody else except the person that did them. In the 70s, I was a kid. I'm a little bit older than I let on sometimes, but there was a show called The Flip Wilson Show. And there was a lady, he dressed up in drag every now and then and did a character, Geraldine. Why'd you do that? The devil made me do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it is. You know, we, if we can't find somebody to blame, we'll blame it on the devil. I still remember a story. I was 30 years old, 35, and it was about a high school team in Dallas, Texas. They had won the state championship. Uh, it was Carter High School in Dallas, Texas. And they had won the state championship in football. A lot of the guys on the team had college scholarships. Some of them were really good, good enough that they were already talking about them being pros. But in that winter and that spring, a bunch of the guys on that football team started holding up convenience stores, started uh, mugging people, started you know, stealing from stores and doing all And consequently, a bunch of them ended up, you know, arrested, tried, and put in jail for a long time because they were using guns and all that, and they were doing it just for fun because it was a thrill. And the quarterback of the team wrote, we did this to ourselves. No one made us hold up the stores. We can't blame anyone but ourselves. Amen. Interesting, isn't it? See, the thought that we have the freedom to choose our own path, and once we choose that path, we deal with the responsibility is a consequence of that path is interesting because today we don't want to do that a kid walks into a, a crowded theater with a gun and he opens up fire and kills 15 people we want to blame the gun we want to blame society oh he was marginalized i'm tired of that world word marginalized it's a hey, oh it's not his fault that's the way he was raised or he was poor or he was hurt or he was offended or he had all kinds of hey, listen I'm, I'm sorry, listen to me carefully. If you do something against the word of God, you did that. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil didn't pull the hammer back on that gun. You know, but oh, we don't want to blame the people that do something. We don't want to blame the person that's accused anymore. We want to find a reason why they did it. We want to find a reason to explain why somebody would act like this. How many times... Do we have to tell a lost and dying world there's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to miss, and there's only one way to get there, and that's through and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, the devil can't make you do it. See, the Bible doesn't teach that the devil can force you to sin. The Bible teaches you that the devil is a liar. The Bible teaches you that the devil is a deceiver. He's a tempter. He's a manipulator. We see that in the third chapter of Genesis when he did those things to Eve. We see when he tricked Eve and talked her into doing all those things that she should have did. And she said, oh, the, the serpent tricked me. 
that didn't go that didn't go over with God she still got punished we see in John the ninth chapter the 44th verse he calls Satan the liar and the father of it you know we see all those things he lies and manipulates and deceives why because he can't make a sin See, if he could make a sin, then he wouldn't need to tempt us. He wouldn't need to lie to us. He wouldn't need to deceive us. He would just force us to sin. And that would be the end of it. But see, he has to do that. He has to tempt us. He has to lie to us. He has to manipulate us. Because, you know, it has to be our choice. God gave us a choice. So, imagine you and I walk up to the edge of a cliff. And we look down into this rocky gorge. Rocky gorge. And I stand there and I look at you and go, you don't know this, but I just kidnapped your daughter and I've got her in my car. I'm going to beat her up and I'll probably even kill her too if you don't jump. And you think about it for a second and you jump. And as you jump, I say, I was just kidding. Did I force you to jump? No. You made a choice. I tricked you. I lied to you, but I didn't force you to jump. See, if I'd forced you to jump, we'd have walked up to the edge of that cliff, and I'd put my hand on you and just pushed you out there. See, Satan can't push us out over that cliff. Satan can't push us into that rocky gorge. We have a choice to make. As we stand there, he's going to lie to us. He's going to tempt us. He's going to manipulate us. He's going to try to deceive us and get us to do that. See, when we jump, It's a choice that we make. When we sin, it's a choice that we make. We have to realize that it's us that's doing it, and we can't blame anybody else. See, the devil didn't tie Eve down and shove that apple into her mouth. He didn't tie her down. Eve didn't grab Adam and go, you're going to eat this because I ate it. No, she gave it to him. He ate it. It was a choice that they made. It was a choice that they made together, and nobody forced them to do that. Nobody forced them to do that. Nobody forced you to take the first drink. Nobody forced you to take the first shot. Nobody forced you to take that first snort. Nobody forced you to crawl into somebody else's bed. Nobody forced you to do those things. Those are choices that you made. Oh, but the devil made me do it. If it's our choice, it's my responsibility. If it's my choice, it's my responsibility for my actions. And I've got to suffer the consequences of that. So if we can't blame somebody else, if we can't say it's just the way I am, if we can't blame the devil, then maybe it's God's fault. Because after all, God's got the authority over everything else, doesn't he? See, isn't he the one that gave me this awful family? Isn't he the one that gave me these horrible friends? Isn't he the one that didn't give me the willpower to say no? Isn't he the one that you know, gave all this around, gave me all this tempting things? James told us that God doesn't tempt us. John and uh, Paul in the 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 9th through the 10th verse, it says, Wherefore ye, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Yeah. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, that's that's Paul saying, hey, no matter what you've done, I'm going to hold you accountable, good or bad, you're accountable for your actions. Good or bad, you're accountable for that. See, it's not God's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not just that's the way I am. It's us. It's the choices that we make. But that's, you know, I've given you all these bad news. But there is good news. The good news is that the Bible clearly teaches us that Jesus Christ died for our sins. The Bible clearly teaches us that he loved me enough to do that. That he shed his blood for the remission of my sins. The Bible clearly teaches that. See, the first step to being covered by the blood of Jesus is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and to accept the responsibility for your own actions. Remember, like we talked about in Sunday school this morning, as the thief's hung there, he goes, listen, 
Don't say anything to him. We're responsible for our actions. That's the reason we're hanging on this cross. That's the reason we're hanging on this cross. See, but as long as I try to find somebody else to blame, as long as I try to find a scapegoat, as long as I try to find somebody to not so that I don't come to grips with the fact that I'm a sinner and don't want to take responsibility for my action, then I'll never receive salvation because I'll never take responsibility for my actions. But if I take responsibility for my actions and I feel sorry for what I've done, I can come to the place where I say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. God, forgive me, have mercy on me. I repent of my sins. See, Donald Barnhouse, he's a Christian writer, he wrote a story one time, and I believe I've told it before. But when he was a kid, their whole farm burned up. The fields burned up, the barns burned up, the outbuildings, the house, everything, everything was just black. It was just a wildfire that came across the plains. Burned up everything in just a couple hours. Everything went up like tender. And his dad was walking across the old farm just looking at it and kicking different things. And, you know, there's a glass here and there's an old tool there and he's kicking and he came up to this thing that was, looked like an old charred stump. And he kicked it. And when he kicked it, it rolled and baby chicks ran everywhere. And as he looked at that old charred stump, it wasn't a charred stump. It was an old chicken who had spread her wings out and covered her chicks and protected them. Yeah, she gave her life, but those chicks lived. See, that's the way Jesus is. He gave his life so that we could have life. He gave his life so that we could live an overcoming life. And when he stood there looking over Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I gather you to me? Just like a mother hen gathers her chicks, gathers her brood to protect you, to cover you under these wings. Under these wings are protection. Under these wings are salvation. Under these wings are security. Under these wings are everything that you'll ever need. And he said, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they won't follow. See, Jesus isn't forcing us to come, but it's a choice that we have to make. Just like we have a choice to sin, we have a choice to come to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, salvation for all mankind. As we all stand, I know this message didn't take very long, but the long version of it was going to be good and long. Uh, but it's all about us. And it's all about Jesus. That's it. Us and Jesus. There shouldn't be anything between us and Jesus. It's all about that relationship. And he wants us to come back into relationship with him. And as they sing, this altar is open. And if you're here, the altar is open. If you're there on Facebook, if you're your driveway, if you're driving, whatever, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ.